Thank you very much. Um, I will apologize if I lose my voice in the middle of this. Um, I, I will say I'm sorry simply because I'm trying to recover from the flu or we're in the middle of a flu, so thank you. I also just want to say that the Maya weekend here over the past 32 years has really been a signature event for Maya studies. Um, it is not just um, an opportunity for researchers to present some of their ideas to, to, to other researchers. It's been an opportunity for us to present our ideas to, to you and to much of the public. And I think this is a very important component of what we have tried to do over the years. I was trying to think last night how many times I have spoken at the Maya weekend. And I, I, I ran out, I ran, stopped counting it about six or seven times. Uh, over the 32 years. And I remember many times being flown up from Belize when I was digging in southern Belize or being flown up from Belize when I was digging in Shunantunich, uh, being put up at the old um, the Penn Tower at the, Hilt the old Hilton uh, to speak, uh, actually meeting my now wife there uh, as she would bring all, um, material that I had to take down to Belize. So it, I have great memories of, of this event. And I think it's a very important one. What I want to talk about today is for us to, to, to begin to rethink a little bit our view of the Maya and to shift a little bit the perspective that we have that the Maya is the ancient Maya and to begin thinking about the Maya today not as simply a smaller, a less elaborate, a less complex um, society than what we see in the ancient world, but rather a society that's incredibly complex, incredibly uh, alive, an incredibly important part of Latin America, um, and, and a society that in fact is trying to reclaim its heritage, and not necessarily along the lines that we might think about that heritage in terms of the ancient Maya. Now many of you have heard some parts of this talk, and some of it's new and some of it uh, relates to the old, because I'm, I just wanted to give a good enough background of where we are in terms of this project. But this is a new project uh, that's gone on for about the last two or three years. Uh, it started really probably a couple of years before that as I was working in uh, Quintana Roo in uh, the eastern part of the Yucatan. And so I just want to focus a little bit on the concepts of cultural heritage first as we begin. Oh, that's that. Hold on a second. No, I'm not sure this is working. I'll try one more time. We'll do it that way. Can you hear me if I step out from here? Is that okay? Thank you. Only because I like to, I like to walk around a little bit. I hate to be stuck to a mic. When I start when I talk about this project, I do like to start with uh, a slide like this. Uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, because it is about heritage preservation. We are trying to preserve heritage and focus upon that, but it's also about community development. So we are working in the town of Kiyosuka that I'll show you in just a few minutes, specifically on heritage identification, heritage preservation, but also in thinking about community development. How can this community survive into the future? And it's a question that I haven't asked specifically, but it's a question that the community has asked. And I also like to make sure I put up the fact that I am simply one of many people working on this project. And my colleagues, Carlos Chana Spinoza, who is the director of the Cast War Museum, Alario Mupat, who is a, an elder in the um, uh, Tiasuko community, and Demetra Put Kahun, who was the past Ahito head in Tiasuko. Um, these are my co collaborators, my co conspirators in this project, as we think about the future and where we can, where we can go. Oops, went one past. And I see now I can't see anything. There we go. So when we think about cultural symbols here in the United States, these are the types of cultural symbols that we obviously focus upon. We focus upon the Iwo Jima Memorial, we focus upon the White House. Obviously, we're in Philadelphia, the Liberty Bell. These are important uh, things of cultural heritage. Um, at the same time, heritage is not as simple as that in the sense that these are also symbols of cultural heritage. Um, these are symbols that are more contested, perhaps, but even I think some of the ones I just showed you are about contested heritage. The symbol of a baseball team in Cleveland, the Cleveland Indians, is very much contested, and you can see signs like this that clearly relate to trying to question the construct of what uh, heritage is. And as I mentioned to several of you, and I just wanted to mention this, this is my favorite t-shirt of all time, uh, it shows four uh, Indians holding rifles, and it says, Homeland Security fighting terrorism since 1492. <laughs> and I 
think that gives, again, a different sense of when you look at the past. Not necessarily looking at the past in one uh, model, but looking at the past with multiple models. And some people say 1492 not as a moment of discovery, but in fact as a moment of, dis of, of destruction, perhaps. And I think this is the type of thing we have to think about in terms of the Maya. We think about the preservation of Maya culture very much tied to the ancient ruins, uh, whether it's a preserved or reconstructed Maya building, such as on the left, or the excavations at Shunantanich uh, on the right. And we begin to separate that very complex society that I talked about uh, from the modern Maya. And we think of the modern Maya as a small, relatively passive group uh, perhaps here, as we see in southern Belize, they are dancing the Cortez dance. And this is, in fact, a reconstruction, a recreation of the arrival of Cortez, the arrival of the Spanish, and the, in fact, destruction of what they saw as Maya culture at that time. But we also have to think of the modern Maya that includes the Zapatistas. And for the past number of years, obviously, the Zapatistas have been a, a powerful element in the Chiapas region um, as a... a, a community of rebellion that controls space. And this, again, gives us this contrasting sense of what heritage is and the nature of what heritage is. And so what I did for the past 30 years was excavate sites like Shunantunich, and this is the Castillo at Shunantunich, and we would actually take it apart, and this is what it looked like back in the 1980s, and we were excavating it through the 90s, and developing it for tourism for the government of Belize. <clears throat> and that was quite effective. And in fact, the number of tourists have increased from about eight to 10,000 when we started the project to today we're somewhere between 60 to 70,000 tourists go to Shunan's Beach. That's quite effective. The issue is, where does that money go? And you can imagine the money certainly doesn't go to the local Maya communities. And their interest in this is as an economic engine for the region. So the question that I want to ask you is, does preserving the Maya as we talk about that, equal or relate specifically to pre the preservation of the ancient Maya only. And that's the way we as archaeologists have seen this. That's the way we as Westerners have seen this vision. This is what brings tourists to the region. One can wander around the Yucatan and begin to see things like a billboard like this that's, that's highlighting Chichen Itza and the attempt to represent Chichen Itza and to bring people there as tourists. One can also see a statue outside of Chetumal of an ancient Maya family. Um, again, this sort of, not necessarily passive, but a, but a, a sense of a small family um, that's sort of disembodied from the nature of the society itself. One can wander around even small towns and see these wonderful murals of, again, ancient Maya cities, of uh, people producing food, uh, tamales and other things. Um, again, this type of sort of relatively neat simple representation. There is no question that the economic importance of Maya heritage, that when you think of ruins and the beach for the Yucatan, you think of Cancun and the six to ten million people who go there annually. You think of a place like Chichen Itza where a million to a million and a half people go there annually. The amount of money that comes into this region is so important to Mexico um, that this is the engine that drives much of this region, but also the engine that drives major parts of Mexico to a large degree. And here you can see the tourists. And what's interesting is you get Mexican tourists, tourists from outside of Mexico, and in fact some of the indigenous people, Maya people, coming to look at the past in some sense. But what's interesting is as you travel around here, you get off the tourist route, you begin to realize, in fact, that the heritage that the people who are, the, who are living there are talking about is not related specifically to the ancient Maya. And they intellectually are very aware that the ancient Maya is part of their past. Rather, however, they see a part of the more integral part of what's important in their past is the caste war of the Yucatan that ran from 1847 to 1901. But in fact, if I change that 1901 to 2014, nobody in the Yucatan would, would object. Nobody would disagree because the feeling is this rebellion, this sense of fighting against the government continues today. And so as you go into Felipe Calle Puerto, which was John Santa Cruz, there is a, um, a monument martyred to the martyrs of the Maya Social War, which is the same war from 1847. 
and I've shown this many times, but it is my favorite mural because it, it represents the Maya as seen today with some of the past, but also the statement of the Maya zone is not an ethnographic museum. We're not here to, ship, to represent Maya culture to you. We're not a museum. We are, in fact, a town movement. We're a community moving forward. And to me, this is much more um, a sense of what, what's going on in the Yucatan today. There is a wonderful and interesting screed here about neoliberalism that I'm not going to go into um, because it really is trying to position the Maya in this globalized world today. Tiasuco is located roughly in the middle of the Yucatan, just about an hour and a half, about 70 kilometers south-southeast of Chichen Itza and about 65, 70 kilometers south of Maya Dali. It is off the tourist trade. The tourist route is predominantly along the coast to Lou Cancun or Cancun to Chichen and to Mexico. So it's off of that, um, that route. It does get a few tourists wandering through, but very few. But this is how this town represents itself in many respects. Um, it's a painting in the, in the little Castle War Museum that is showing this sort of the, the, the position of this war at breaking the, the bonds that tie them both to Mexico, to the church, but the church is still continues to be an important part of that community. One of the interesting positions in the Yucatan is, in fact, there is, the church remains important, but it's, in fact, a Maya church. And this Maya church is focused upon, originally, the talking cross that appeared in 18, um, 1850. The, the talking cross does not exist today, but the talking cross during this war help the Maya continue the rebellion, help the Maya move forward and fight against uh, the Mexicans uh, and the Yucatecos. This is the shrine of the new building that is in front of the altar of the, the Talking Cross. This is in Chan Santa Cruz. This is the Sanctuary of the Cruz Palante, the Sanctuary of the Talking Cross. This is the altar. Uh, we have been allowed to photograph it. Um, many times they don't allow people to do that. The Mexican state has built, the government has built a small chapel there, and next to it we are in the process of trying to think through how we can help build a small museum. This is an important part of the talking of the of these um, rebellion area and identifying the rebellion today. There are five of these sacred ceremonial centers, one here, four in other neighboring towns, and each of them is controlled by a general, and then they have lieutenants and they have uh, sergeants and they have all, Privates, and these are people who guard these centers on a weekly basis. They come in from their towns, they live in these centers. This military part of the caste war continues today. As you drive through, you will also see monuments, not to the ancient Maya, but monuments to the leaders of the rebellion. This is Cecilio Chi, one of the first leaders of the rebellion. He's got a machete in his right hand, he's got a torch in his left hand. Uh, there's a monument here that indicates that he's buried here, he probably isn't, but that's not important, what the perception is. This is what they see as their heritage in this particular region. And then in Tiasuco, where we're working, here is Jacinto Pac, one of the earlier leaders of the caste war, and the church, and I'll talk about the church in just a couple of minutes. Now, the rebellion, and many of you may have heard about the, the caste war, if, with your interest in uh, Latin America and the Maya area, but the rebellion has to be seen as a huge conflagration that moved hundreds of thousands of people throughout the region, forced, forced them to move around, killed tens of thousands of people. This was a major war that at one time allowed, almost allowed the Maya to create either their own government, their own state, or in fact, uh, there was a certain amount of negotiation of trying to connect it to the United States. Um, this is some paintings from after the war, but gives you the sense of the destruction of the government and the government uh, army moving into this region, trying to control it and to protect it. As it turns out, one of the reasons that the Mexican federal government felt so strongly about maintaining its control in the region was the fact that of Hennequin. Hennequin was producing the rope that was being bought from the sailing ships around the world. It was one of the richest cities in the world at this time. It was one of the most important economic resources at this time. And so the Mexican army
army and the Mexican government did spend a lot of time and energy to pacify uh, the wild Maya, uh, indigenous Maya. And in fact, in 1901, General Bravo was given the task of quite literally cutting his way through the jungle, cutting a huge swath through the jungle, taking his horses, taking his cannons through this jungle, and to pacify the Maya. Here, is, here he is with his, his other generals and lieutenants, and here is his, his army in Chan Santa Cruz that turns into Felipe Puerto in 1901. The Maya general who signed this treaty is seen in very different lights today. I mean, the Maya general who signed this treaty, General Mai, is perceived somewhat as a traitor by the modern Maya today. This is the region we're talking about. Chichen Itza here on the main road, we're in the east-west, Maya Dalid. Cancun further up, Tulum, right along the coast. Some of the sacred cities of the Maya today, and the area that we are working in right here, in the northwest corner of Quintana Road, uh, the larger town of Tiusipo, Tepic, and the abandoned town of Tela. And this, one has to think about this, not as just a map, but to think about this as contested landscape. This is a landscape that is contested. It was contested in 1847. And in fact, in 1847, 1848, the Maya, moving out of Tiasuco and other of these towns, began to control this entire region. But it's contested today. Who controls it? All I can tell you is that in Tiasuco, the head of INA for the region, the Instituto Nacional de Antropología y Historia, that controls all of archaeology and anthropology, this woman who's in charge, Adriana Velasquez, has been physically removed from Tiasuco twice in 20 years. So this rebellious construct is still very much there. There is a museum for the caste war in Tiasuco, representations of the leaders. This is what they see as, again, as their heritage. And again, the do this is a, uh, a, it's been changed quite recently, but this is a donor's room with things that the community has picked up and thought is important to them. And in the backdrop is, in fact, a bust of one of the later leaders of the caste war, Bernardino Ken, and his skull. His skull had been taken to Merida to prove that he had been killed um, back in the 1860s. I do not know why the A is on it, but on the back is, is inscribed the fact that this is the skull of Bernardino you know, Can killed at Shushub and the date. Um, and this is this skull stands is put there as a monument to the to the battle and to the war. And in fact, every year in July. There is an anniversary, and the descendants of these leaders come together, and here are the descendants are gathered in front of Bernardino Ken's skull. Um, in fact, this family is from Belize, but this is the Ken family, and they come, and they are the descendants of Bernardino Ken. Um, and this is in the museum where there is usually an encuentro. This is a gathering together of the descendants uh, and other people who talk about the caste war. And uh, the direct descendants of the leaders of the caste war. Now, the project has developed extensively over the past two to three years. And let me just say that when I started wandering around this area about five or six years ago, I thought there was a project here, but I didn't know what it was. And when I would go into these towns, I would ask, do you have remnants from the caste war out in the jungle somewhere that you preserved? And the answer was always no. Now the interesting thing is it took two years where one day I was sitting having coffee with someone who had become a friend in this town who said to me, are you interested in this stuff? And I said, yes. And he said, if you're interested, let's go. And I looked at him and said, what do you mean? He said, let's go. And there out in the jungle, they have been saving without the support of the government, without the support of anybody, their own heritage related to the caste war. And so we have started a series of projects, many of them in fact projects that the community has asked us to start related to the caste war in Tiasuco and community development. The first one being archaeology, and then I'll go through all of these fairly quickly. And the archaeology, and this, this project, the archaeology side of the project is in charge, uh, is headed up by Tiffany Kane, who is here, and she will be speaking in the afternoon about some of the haciendas uh, around, out of the jungle. Uh, she's a second year graduate student here, it's a wonderful work. Uh, but in fact, they had been pres preserving from Kiyosuko on their land, on the Aikido, an abandoned town called Tela that had 3,000 people in about 1847, along with Kulin Beach, which is really 
the, one of the most sacred locations, which is the Hacienda of Asinto Pot. I'm just going to show a slide or two very quickly, but let uh, Tiffany talk about that in more detail. But these are three of the people, Carlos, uh, Chad, Espinosa here, Alanio Upat, and Freddy Balam, who took me to Kula Pita first to say, this is what we have been preserving. This is our heritage. And in fact, this is Jacinto Pat. We don't have a photograph or real drawing of him uh, from life. This is a reconstructed drawing of who he looks like, of uh, what he might have looked like, excuse me. And here he is in Tiasuka. But what's interesting is he was known for going into battle with his machete. And what's wonderful about this, this is a fiberglass uh, a statue. Uh, and what they have done is shown the machete as if it's been sharpened along the edges as he's ready to go into battle to cut off heads and arms and so on. This is not a passive sculpture in any way. This is Kula Peach, the main, the main house here, the entrance to the hacienda. It turns out that Jacinto Pat was a hacendado. He was a wealthy man who was uh, able to uh, march quite a number of resources, and Kula Peach became the center of the rebellion in 1847 and just before that. And again, the access into this very elaborate hacienda that Tiffany will be talking about was both a walk-in access and possibly the beginnings of, of an attempt to keep people out of Coulomb Beach um, with these um, constructions, uh, as well as the, the large carriage entrance. The other place that we're working is this abandoned town. And in this entire town, uh, abandoned, this is the, some GPS points just to give you a sense of this out in the jungle. Um, but here, and Tiffany has been in the process of, of mapping this. This is the last section of the town that needs to be mapped this coming season. Excuse <coughs> me. Excuse me. Um, but I'm going to show you right here in Central Plaza with an act with a church that's still active, other buildings here. But you can begin to see that this is a, this is a series of walls that I'll show you. And these walls create roadways that are having two parallel walls. They create uh, solaris or house compounds. And about 3,000 people lived at Tela in 1847. Uh, this is one of the buildings, perhaps of the governor or one of the leaders uh, in the downtown section. It is a fairly typical squared up building, colonial building, um, 18th and 19th century building in the downtown section of Tela. In addition, off in the distance, you can see the church. And the church is, in fact, an active church today. Uh, it has an altar. It's a church of St. Michael the Archangel. Uh, plastic sculpture here. I think I have one more slide. Yeah. St. Michael the Archangel as he's slitting, slitting the dragon. Um, some crosses here. Another St. Michael the Archangel. And there he is on the wall. And this is the 19th century paintings that we see uh, on the wall there. One of the important critical elements is the work that we're doing as part of the community. So we bring young kids out there and talk about the concepts of heritage, but also bring out elders to talk about this. And this, this woman, who I've known for a number of years, literally got out there, pulled me down, and began telling me stories. But this is part of the central committee in organizing and thinking about what the, how the project is developing and where the project is going. And out in the jungle, you can see walls like this. It doesn't look like much, but this is, this is a wall. As it turns out, this is probably a roadblock um, that blocks one, a couple of the roads into and around Tela. And here you can see it from this painting, a series of roadblocks. And this is a road into the community with a roadblock there, a roadblock here. This is being breached, another roadblock here being breached. This gives you a sense of what's going on in terms of what we're seeing on the ground archaeologically. I put this slide up mainly because I just want to emphasize the amount of work that we do with the community. Uh, clearly I'm here. Carlos is there. Uh, Wynn Shorter will be speaking today. with not on the project specifically, but was visiting. And Tiffany Kane, uh, who is on the project, is working on the mapping project. These are just some of the people who are working with us. And the amount of time that we are doing talking about what their interest is and what their constructs of heritage is. Another important part of this, I think this really developed partly from our own interest, but also from some of the community's interest, is the oral histories of Tiasuko. 
one of the critical elements is nobody around today, obviously, here during the, was living during the Castle War. But Tiasuka was completely abandoned, and it was reoccupied by 1930. And one of the things we're thinking about is to learn more and more about the perceptions of the Castle War, the perceptions of heritage, and the perceptions of Tiasuko today. And Marceline, Marcelina Chan Kanche, uh, Kristen and Kristen Zaria are really sort of heading up this project now and are doing oral histories as the elders of this community um, are still around, but obviously, as happens in every community, gradually they are dying off and more people become elders. Um, but this is an important part of trying to understand the early occupation of Tiasuko uh, back to the 1930s. Archives is another critical element. And here is Julio Hoyle Gutierrez, who is a young man from a neighboring town. Uh, working with Carlos John Espinosa and Suzanne Abel from Stanford University, discussing the nature of the archives and what we're able to find and think about in terms of these archives, including census material for the abandoned town of Taylor. And this, just very quickly, gives a sense of how many people were living in Tiasuko. Um, 7,400 people were living in Tiasuko in 1832, 2,653 in the local nearby and that abandoned town in 1832 had 2,367. Later on, it's 2,765 with a different census. This is the type of information that we're beginning to get out of the census, and we can tie this into the archaeological material in the field. These, this is, these are the three sort of critical uh, elements of towns to start. Tiasuko, which is the largest and really a very wealthy town. The abandoned town out in the jungle today, but an important town in the past. And to peak, which was the first town to be destroyed in the Caste War. Where, in fact, in Kulam Peak, which is located out here, people, people gathered, and after one of the other leaders of the Caste War was killed by the Yucatecos, they marched onto Peach in July of 1847 and destroyed the town. And just very quickly, we have found five haciendas around us. Tiffany will be talking about that. We, we believe there are another seven out there in the jungle that we'll be looking for over the next several years. Part of the work is the work in the town in, the, in terms of the museum, which is a very critical element, working on brochures and new photographs, trying to make sure that that story is being told. And then the town itself is part of this archaeological study, is part of the study of what is, in fact, the caste war, what is the heritage of the mine. So, in fact, one can see these abandoned, everything was abandoned by, um, between 18, roughly 18, probably 66 and 1930, and then reoccupied slowly. And uh, people like th this woman here are living inside this, this building. There is no roof. She has built a small uh, hut inside this building and is living there. She owns that building. Uh, some of them have been renovated slightly. But this, these are very elaborate buildings. And in fact, as it turns out, Chris Jones, was here on his honeymoon. In 1969, were you in Bayer What? Were you in Bayer at the time? Yeah, we were staying, staying in Bayer We didn't have a car or anything. So, on 1969, Leslie and Chris were in Bayer on their honeymoon, decided to take a day and come down. It was a festival day. I'm not going to show lots of slides of that. Uh, it's a wonderful bullfight that's going on. There's the Ferris wheel and so on and so forth. But Here's a photograph of one of the buildings that was abandoned, or was still abandoned in 1969, um, in the, right near the central part of Tiasuko. Um, and so we, what we're trying to do also is to gather photographs from all these different time periods to look at and understand um, what was happening in Tiasuko. So Chris's slides are wonderful. And there are, when I show them, and I've given copies in, in to, to the museum, there's lots of discussion about who everybody is, and obviously this is a number of years ago. So people are starting to say, oh, that must be so-and-so. And then there's actually a lot of discussion, usually in Maya, which I don't understand, uh, about who that person is. But this is part of the heritage and history that they see. It's very important. And then within the central part of Tiasuko is the church and the convent. Now, this, these are Chris's photographs from 1969 again. And you can see that the church was badly destroyed. Uh, in fact, it was completely destroyed in 1866. It was bombed and destroyed. It was blown up by the Maya. Uh, about 1,000 pounds of TNT were used to blow this thing up. Very large church. 
This is what it looked like in 1969. This is what it looks like today. And they have reconstructed the vault of the central part of the church up to here and have left this facade fragment sticking up in the air as a reminder of the rebellion, as a reminder of the destruction that was caused in the 19th century. Uh, so this is very much part of the central part of what is, in fact, Tiasuko today. What's interesting is this is the central part of a very large complex that extends into the back, which was a convent. And here is part of the convent. And you can see up above, looking down, the various segments of this, what was the past convent. Some of it has been reconstructed from the priest who lives there, but some of it is off and has, the, the roofs have fallen in and so on. One of the things that we are going to start this year, we just got permission about a month ago, is to move into this convent and to begin making detailed maps of what was there, what is there, what's preserved, and so on. To think about the preservation of this location. Um, there are wonderful stories that, in fact, what, goes, what went on in this convent caused the caste war, caused the rebellion. One of the stories is of Cecilio Chi having sent his daughter into the convent. At one time, tried to see his daughter wasn't able to see her. So he climbed a tree and looked in. And there he saw the women of the convent walking along, and they were all pregnant. And one of his daughter was pregnant. Um, and he was so upset and so angry that he demanded to get in. He couldn't get in, so he went off with a cinto pot, and they stormed in. And this was all part of the, the beginnings of the caste war and its rebellion against the Catholic Church. I'm not sure it's real, but it's an interesting story about the relationship of the power of the church and the local community. Part of this is also about preservation of my language. And I will say, this is, the, many of these projects are part of this community standing up and saying, these are the things that represent us. This is what we want to see. This is what we want to see in terms of the community. And Francis, to be a talk from, as a first or second year graduate student here at the University of Pennsylvania in Education, is helping us think about how one preserves a, an indigenous language. And in addition, there has been a trip to Chichen Itza with people from the community to think about and to talk about the relationship of this community that's tied to the caste war to the ancient Maya Chichen Itza. And it was a fascinating conversation that was occurring in both Spanish and in Maya, but very much a, a, a deliberate conversation that questioned the relationship not intellectually, but question the relationship and the importance of the ancient Maya for these people. And again, I take my cues from them, not, in fact, from what I see myself as an archaeologist. One of the interesting things is quite recently, just in the past October, one of the things we did is we presented a paper at a, con a uh, conference of, of, of indigenous towns of Latin America from the, from the centuries 19th and 20th through the 21st century. And we presented an abstract and got accepted. And Marcelina and I went, along with Julio, who's here. Um, a few others were trying to come and weren't, able, weren't allowed to leave. What was interesting in this conference is that the first two papers, and this was a conference to how do you integrate indigenous people into the work. And the first two people in, this, um, in the Congress were Mexican archaeologists, who basically said, well, we kind of work with indigenous people, but we really don't really want to. And we just have to work with them, but we sort of tell them what we're going to do, and we just go do it. And what was interesting is that Marcelina presented the paper of what we, what we were trying to do. And it elicited a much larger conversation about the relationship between governments and indigenous people. And the Mexicans basically had no interest. While the people from Venezuela, from South America, were extremely intrigued by these questions and were very much part of that conversation. The Mexicans, particularly from Eno, were saying, we just do our work. We go do, do archaeology. If indigenous people want to come along, great. If they don't, we don't care. And so this is really very much part of what was seen as an interesting contrast that goes on in Mexico today. So I just, in going back, I just want to mention what we are trying to think about in terms of my heritage in the future of my heritage, is for us to begin to ask questions about what the local communities see as heritage. Not to deny that the ancient Maya is important. Economically very important, interesting from an intellectual perspective. But many people, not all of them, many people in this community and in these communities from the UK tie themselves 
built back, yes, to the ancient Maya, but that's too far in the past, to what was, in fact, an important rebellion to them. We don't tie ourselves back, necessarily, to the, to the Neanderthals of Europe. We tie ourselves back to the American Revolution a couple hundred years ago. It's exactly what this is, this, this, this incredible conflagration of the 19th century. As I said, this is this comp very conflicted landscape, Tested landscape. There is some discussion about in the past the government trying to create a tourist route related to the caste war. There is some question: Can a place like Tiasupo survive into the future? Can Tiasupo be an active community in the future when, in fact, all the young people in Tiasupo are leaving to go to Chichen Itza via to leave Kantu and Tulum on one of the hotels, some of the hotels, and they're not coming back? And that's where the community development question. How does Tiasupo survive in the 21st century? Its agricultural base is diminishing in terms of the quantity of material that is produced on that land. It's lousy land anyway. What else do you produce there? And this is the conversation we're having. We're not ready. I don't think the community is nor am I to say this is what we're going to do in the future. This is from the past. But to think about is there a tourist business that the people of Tiasupo know is developed but can control? Because the story of the ancient Maya tends to be told by the archaeologists like me and the others who will stand up here today. And part of what's happening in Tiasuko is the desire to say, we want to tell our story, not let our others tell the, our story for, for us. And this is the way I think that story they have the interest in trying to tell. They want to tell the story as they perceive it in terms of the church, in terms of the Mexican government, in terms of slavery. Whether that's truth or not, I don't know what that means anymore. This is the story that they want to tell. And what we're trying to do is to facilitate that, the telling of that story in ways that make sense, both archaeologically, anthropologically, and many respects from a touristic perspective. Thank you very much.